Welcome to this video where we'll be comparing our experiences on MSC, Mirella and PNO and we've been lucky enough to take cruises on all three of these cruise lines in 2024 and these three cruise lines have been battling fiercely for the budget cruise line market in the UK trying to tempt those new to cruise as well as those more seasoned cruisers and we'll be focusing on the onboard experience only and excluding all aspects of itineraries and ports. We're also going to take a close look at the total cost of the cruise so that you can see which of the cruises gave us the best value for money in our opinion. Now previously our comparisons between P&O and Morella have seen Morella come out on top but will MSE prove to be the better budget option or is 2024 the year that P&O finally shine? So keep watching to see which of these three cruise lines we felt gave us the best value for money. So we'll kick things off by taking a look at the three ships on which we sailed. So starting with Morella Discovery 2, a formal Royal Caribbean Vision class ship built in 1995 and serving with Morella since 2017. She has 11 passenger decks serving about 1800 passengers. Now MSC Armonia is MSC's oldest and smallest ship that's still in service. It was built in 2001. She has nine passenger decks and accommodates about 2,050 passengers. P&O Iona on the other hand is a much more modern and a much larger ship. Built as recently as 2021, she accommodates nearly 5,200 passengers across 16 accessible passenger decks. So are age and size of ship a determining factor on what happens with your onboard experience? Keep watching and we'll find out. So let's kick off this comparison with our first category, which is pre-cruise planning. Now all three companies operate an online portal where you're required to input pre-cruise information like passport details, details of insurance, all that kind of stuff next to kin. And both MSC and P&O require you to upload details of a credit card also so that online bills can be paid. Both P&O and MSC also require you to upload a passport style photo with the aim being to speed up your embarkation process. Miranda on the other hand doesn't require either the photo or the credit card with these processes actually taking place at the point of embarkation. All three portals allow you to download boarding passes and luggage labels too. And P&O's and Morella's portals work absolutely fine with no problems. MSC on the other hand, well, their portal didn't allow us to upload a photo and that crashed the whole process. And what we ended up having to do was to phone the MSC helpline where a lovely lady did manage to override all the protocols and actually directly send us the boarding passes without us having to upload a photo, which we then had to do on embarkation. All portals allowed the booking of excursions, speciality dining, if it was available that is, as it wasn't on the MSC ship, but there were also drinks packages that you could upgrade to as well as Wi-Fi and all of that, and all of these options appeared to work fine. Both P&O and MSC portals also allow a cabin upgrade bidding system to operate. We didn't take advantage of this, so we can't really comment on whether it worked well or not. P&O also send regular emails ahead of the cruise showcasing the ship and the excursions available. And P&O also have a loyalty scheme which gives discounts when you book dining and excursions via the portal. And this really worked well. We kind of like this option. We like the loyalty scheme, but we also like the fact that it applies discounts to things like dining and speciality dining and drinks packages and things like that. So how are we going to score this? Well, we're really going to give four points for their portal, which worked really well. MSC's portal didn't work and we had a long wait on our helpline to get our boarding passes, so we're just going to give that a measly one point. But P&O, with their loyalty scheme as well as their portal working fine, we're going to give five points. So in this next category, we're going to talk about embarkation and disembarkation. And embarkation on all three ships was fairly easy overall. On MSC and P&O, it was quite straightforward. You dropped your bags off upon arriving at the cruise terminal. You made your way to the check-in desk, so your passports and boarding passes, then through some security, and before long, you're going down a gangplank and you're aboard the ship. Both required you to find and check in at your muster station before finding your cabins. And then once in your cabin, you watch the safety video. Easy, hey? Well, not quite, because as it happened on MSC, the scanners at the muster stations weren't working and we didn't know that. The member of crew scanned our boarding passes 
and then said, yeah, you can go to your cabin now. We only found out later on, well, not even the same day, about two days later on, that those scanners weren't working when we received a fairly strongly and unpleasantly worded letter from the MSC and the captain saying that we had failed to attend our muster station, which is actually a requirement of international maritime law. And then they required us to go again to have a repeat muster drill which we didn't really appreciate that. But do you know what I did think at the time and what we did feel at the time is that, you know, if the scanners weren't working at the drill when we were supposed to get on board the ship, I wonder what would happen if there was a real emergency. So that was a real disappointment for MSC. No such problems on P&O though, and their system and their scanners worked perfectly. Morella was a fly cruise, and when we arrived at the airport, we departed the airport and then passed our suitcases to a van and lorry that was going to take our bags and cases to the ship separately and they would arrive in our cabins later that day. Upon arriving at the cruise terminal the first thing we had to go through was security and then we found ourselves on board the ship but once on board the ship we went into one of the lounge areas there where we then had to present our boarding passes, have our photo taken, give our credit card details and then we were then directed to our cabin and once in our cabin we were able to watch the safety video and then we were free to roam about the ship. Now the muster drill was done actually the following day. We actually arrived the day before we set sail and the muster drill was done in the old fashioned style where at a predetermined time we were all required to make our way to our assembly points where a member of crew would then scan us and scan our boarding cards to make sure that we had done that. It was actually quite nice to do it in the old fashioned way, but it was a bit of a trip down memory lane in all honesty. In all cases, our luggage arrived promptly at our cabins. There were no issues. Now, disembarkation was very different for each cruise. p and self-checkout at Southampton is easy and effortless. Highly recommend that. You just take your own bags off the ship if you want to and leave as soon as you can in the morning. You can have your luggage brought ashore if you'd prefer, and that involves the usual process of putting your suitcases out the night before you disembark, and then waiting to disembark at a predetermined time based on the cabin and the deck that you're on. But for us, self-checkout just worked well for us again. We use it every time we sail into Southampton with P&O. Morella required us to put out our cases the night before disembarking, and in the morning we waited on board, and we sat around in one of the lounges for our set time for disembarkation. And at that time, we simply disembarked, made our way through the cruise terminal, collected our cases, and then made our way to the awaiting transport to the airport outside the cruise terminal. Again, it was fairly easy. MSC generally followed the same process as Morella, but for some reason, they started disembarking passengers very late in the morning. Allocated disembarkation times appeared to ignore passengers who have paid or earned through their loyalty scheme a priority disembarkation time. This seemed to be completely ignored by MSC and caused quite a bit of upset amongst the passengers and quite a lot of confusion also. And the combination of late disembarkation and this allocation of time slots did mean that some passengers did miss their planned and booked excursions at the disembarkation port, or in some cases we were aware of some passengers even missing flights. Again, it seemed MSC were not shining. So how are we going to score this category? Well, we're going to give Morella four points. Their procedures generally worked. The muster drill was a little old-fashioned. p worked seamlessly. We're going to give that five points, but MSC to give it two points I think is on the generous side given the complete chaos they created on disembarkation. So in this next category we're going to talk about cabins. We book inside cabins normally and did so on each of these three cruises. MSC did give us a complimentary cabin upgrade which was certainly appreciated and the cabin itself was spacious, well designed, not particularly modern but very bright, very airy and well configured. Our only niggle with the MSC cabin was aspects of cleanliness. p and provided a modern and very well specified cabin. Again, plenty of space and storage space, a large screen TV, which is a modern feature, and it had a really large bathroom with a screen on the shower too. In fact, this was one of the best inside cabins we've sailed in, 
and it was kept spotlessly clean by our cabin steward in last year. The Morella cabin was smaller and much more cramped than the others. It was also in need of a bit of TLC too. There were some broken drawers, which was disappointing. There was some rust in the showers and the aircon was either all or nothing. We can't fault the team that kept it clean though. They worked tirelessly, so thank you to those guys. But overall, the Morella cabin was probably the worst of the three. So scoring the cabins, we're going to give Morella two points. We're going to give NSC three and a half points. And Piano again, get top scores at five points. So in this category, we're going to talk about ships facilities. And it won't come as a surprise that Piano Iona comes out on top in this category too. It is a much more modern ship built in 2021. And it has an abundance of bars, restaurants, clubs, of four screen cinema, great kids facilities, sports course, golf driving nets, a huge number of pools and hot tubs all around the promenade deck. It even has its own distillery on board. And although you did have to book a lot of things owing to the number of passengers on board, this was fine and there was always something you could do on board. MSC and Morella were much smaller ships, but both had a good range of facilities on board to entertain passengers. There were plenty of bars and pubs, kids areas, spas, gyms, theatres. The MSC ship though didn't have any speciality dining options, which was quite a surprise. The Morella ship did have a great mini golf course, which we really enjoyed. And it also had a climbing wall too, and we saw some of the passengers making use of that. It also had a range of speciality dining options. Now, all of the ships had enough sun lounging areas, but it was probably the Morella ship that felt the most crowded on sea days. Both MSC and p Iona had more than ample deck space for all the sun loungers. But what was nice about both of those ships is there were areas of the ship where you could take yourself away and find relative peace and quiet and even grab a snooze in the sun. So in terms of ship facilities, we're going to score Morella three points. We're going to score MSC two points and we're going to give p five points. So in this next category, we're going to talk about ship's atmosphere. And this was a category where there was some real divergence between the three cruise lines. Now p Iona was far more chilled and far more relaxed than other P&O ships that we've sailed on. The demographic was a younger one and there were plenty of families enjoying the ship and all of its facilities. I mean even the music offerings and the various bars and club areas and things, well they were aimed at a younger audience too. Staff were happy, helpful and smiling a lot and they were happy to help and engage the customers and passengers on board. Members of the senior staff and crew were publicly visible. This was a marked change from previous p and cruises we've gone on. The captain was seen out and about, was seen at the gangplank at port stops. In fact, there was clear leadership from the senior crew on board Iona. And I think that had a massive positive contribution to the overall atmosphere on board. The ship really did have a buzz and there was a fairly busy program of activities too. Yes, p still have their dress codes and this is clearly still an issue for some passengers. But the staff on Iona just seemed just that little bit more relaxed about this. And I think that led to more and more of the passengers making a little bit of an effort, particularly on nights like celebration night. And that gave a much more inclusive and much more enjoyable atmosphere on these occasions right across the whole ship. And it was really refreshing to see P&O make this that little compromise for the benefit of the majority of passengers on the ship. So well done P&O for that. Now Morella of course already in that space. And Morella continues to be consistent in delivering a happy, good, feel good atmosphere right across all of their ships. The passenger demographic was an older one and Discovery 2 is an adults only ship. Now the absence of families and young children on board a ship may suit some, but it does impact the atmosphere on board we feel. Again, Morella had a very visible senior crew and you'd often find yourself chatting with them inadvertently as you wandered around the ship. We like this. Morella entertainment teams really shine again here and you'll find them everywhere, visibly in your face and around the ship, constantly engaging with passengers, just making sure everything is fine and everybody's having a good time. 
Now Morella put on a really lively programme of games, quizzes and other activities. And yes, the other cruise lines do them too. But on Morella, you can't really miss them. They are everywhere and they are also a whole heap of fun. Dress codes on Morella are more inclusive and relaxed. Now Dress to Impress Night did see many passengers taking to the formal dress option. But it was always an option and never mandated anywhere you went. And that did, I think, lead to a much more inclusive atmosphere during the evening. Most passengers made some kind of effort, and it was the case that nobody was ever excluded from any areas, certainly not that we saw. One of the things we really like about Morella is that there is live music somewhere on board throughout the day and the evening, and we feel this helps create a good buzz and a good vibe on board the ship. We've sailed with Morella a few times. We've always felt that Morella ships are fun places to be, and Discovery 2 was no exception to that. And you've got to admire Morella's consistency in this area. It is a really important part of their whole cruise offering. MSC Armonia was very different. First, and unlike the other two lines, the ship is multicultural, attracting passengers from many nationalities right across the whole world. Whereas PO and Morella, well, they're nearly exclusively catering for the British cruise passenger. This manifested itself in many different ways. Probably the most notable, though, was that the announcements made were made in several languages. And this was actually really good, although it did mean that the announcement did go on a bit, as they were repeated in each language in turn. One positive, though, was that oh, my French and my Spanish did improve just a little. The multicultural aspects did also influence the entertainment on board and the conduct of those activities, too. And the programme of activities on board did try and cater for the national preferences of the passengers too. And there was always something going on and these activities were always well attended and seemed to be well enjoyed by the passengers. The passenger demographic was also a younger one, with many multi-generational family groups aboard. And whilst this was nice, when combined with the language barriers aboard, it did mean that there was less socialising between groups. Senior crew were distant and we never saw them around the ship. Staff appeared far less happy and content also and we did witness some less than acceptable behaviour from some staff members towards passengers. Examples sadly included staff members failing to hold doors open for mothers with prams and the elderly on walking aids and this did shock us a little and some of the staff did seem to be pretty unhappy with their lot. Dress codes were again pretty relaxed and we saw very few people going the extra mile to dress up in the evenings. Summing up our time on MSC Armonia, well the ship really didn't have a buzz and it never really felt like a happy or fun place to be. So in terms of scores we're going to give Morella 4 points, we're going to give MSC 2 points and we're going to give PO 5 points. So now we're going to turn to food and drinks and food and drinks are an essential part of any cruise holiday. And this was perhaps the category with the greatest differences in approach. Morella offer an all-inclusive experience, although they do have a range of speciality dining options at extra cost, of course. Food offerings in the main dining room and in the buffet were fine. Just fine. Not exceptional, nor memorable. And with the menu being similar in both the main dining room and buffet, also, you get pretty similar choices in both. There were daily themed offerings, also following a foods of the world approach. If this wasn't your preference, there were always staples available, like roasts and chicken dishes and salads, if you don't fancy any of the themed options. The range of offerings on the Morella ship was not as extensive as the other cruise lines, but the food was hot and it was relatively tasty, although not exceptional. Our speciality Dining experience in surf and turf was, to be frank, a bit of a letdown and it was a bit more like pub food than a speciality meal experience. And given the price tag, we did feel a little disappointed by this. Morella's all-inclusive drinks option, though, is a plus. No worries about running up a bill. And the included drinks covered wines, beers, ciders and a range of spirits and cocktails. And it's fine. And the cocktails were also fine. Actually, they were quite good. If you wanted a premium drink or a premium cocktail, well, there was a charge for it. But you could do these on a pay-as-you-go basis. Any additional premium drinks that you do decide to savour, well, they're just simply added to your room bill.
Now the included drinks package may not include some of the premium drinks brands that some people prefer, but for us it was totally suitable. Glass of wine with dinner, cocktail, beer or cider in the evening, soft drinks in the day, all within the price of the holiday. It is pretty good. Overall, Morella's food and drink offering does the job. It doesn't necessarily stand out, but it's pretty decent. Now to MSC, and MSC's food offering was probably the worst food we've ever had on a cruise. Food was cold throughout our time on board, and they just simply couldn't keep any of their hot meals warm at all. Ingredients were also poor. In fact, some of the meals were definitely inedible. There were some interesting flavours, but also some of the menu choices that they provided were on the little bit obscure side. I think one of my most baffling sort of food experiences on board MSC was being served fried carrots with an English breakfast. It's a new one on me. There were also some difficulties finding food suitable for those with food allergies or food intolerances, and staff were seemingly unwilling to help also. Now, before completely rubbishing MSC's food offering, and I've probably already done that, I've got to give some credit for MSC's pizza, which is absolutely amazing and probably the tastiest pizza I've ever had on a cruise. That said, it was the only decent food on the ship, as there were no speciality dining options available either. You couldn't even pay extra for some decent food aboard. Now the drinks on the other hand did redeem MSC's offering just a little. Now drinks weren't cheap on a pay-as-you-go basis, but MSC did put up a pretty good offer on their easy drinks package. Now we don't normally do drinks packages, we don't normally take them, but we knew looking at the prices of the drinks aboard that we would get good value for money if we took the drinks package. And the big bonus of that was, well, the quality of the cocktails. I found they were incredible. Really well made, with very generous measures of spirits too. The wines we tasted were to a really good standard, and there was a really good selection of beers and ciders and other drinks on board in terms of really good premium spirits provided as well. And it was, however, just as well the drinks offering on board MSC was so good because the food offering was largely inedible. Now to p and Iona, and this was a really pleasant surprise. There was a vast range of dining options available. There were three main dining rooms to choose from. There was the buffet, of course, the brilliant Keys takeaway food outlets, and p and full range of speciality dining restaurants as well. In fact, there were so many dining options, we couldn't try them all in the week we had aboard. Food menus really differed massively across the dining outlets, and we really welcomed that because it gave you a really good choice. Food allergies and food intolerances were really well catered for, and there were clear areas where you could get things like soya milk and a whole range of dishes especially prepared for those with food allergies and food intolerances. This was really clearly signed, and there was actually a really good choice available. All food we had on board was excellent. Hot food was piping hot. All foods were really tasty. In fact, it was a really excellent food offering and it was really hard to fault. In fact, it was possibly some of the best food we've had on a cruise. Speciality dining did feel special in terms of menus, setting and service, and it was priced reasonably too. We really loved the food on p and Iona and it really did great, really comparably with some of the more premium cruise lines like Celebrity. Empty plates all round for us. Now to drinks and drinks packages on P&O are, let's be honest, very poor value. And you don't have to search too hard on YouTube to find other YouTube channels that have done the maths and tested P&O's drinks packages to see if they are good value or poor value. And almost universally, they come out with P&O's drinks packages being rubbish value. We concur with this mathematics and we'd never get our money's worth if we actually took one of the drinks packages. So if you do go on a pay-as-you-go basis with the drinks on board p and you'll find the drinks prices are pretty reasonable and comparable with a UK pub. Probably cheaper than some of the pubs in the south of England as well, I'd say. The drinks themselves were fine and probably the only complaint we'd have is that some of the cocktails, well, they were pretty light in their measures of spirits. Wines were good. Beers were good. Generally no complaints. So overall, p and Iona was a really good food and drink offering. So what about those scores in this important category? 
Well, we're going to give Morella three and a half points. MSC, not begrudgingly giving them one and a half points, but the cocktails and the pizza were good. And Piano, we're going to give five points. And in this next category, we're going to talk about entertainment. And entertainment is a personal choice. And different people enjoy different things. But we do think that there were some marked differences in the three offerings from these cruise lines. Morella's strength has and continues to be its entertainment offerings. Its showcast put on a Broadway style show on five nights of the week and these are all to a very high standard. The incredibly hard working showcast are also available for meet and greet. They also put on dance lessons and they also support the various game shows and quizzes that go on around the ship. How do they find the time? Live music is a big part of Morella's entertainment offering. And throughout the day and the evening, there's always some live music going on somewhere on board. Morella's entertainment team are tirelessly visible and are always out and about entertaining the staff and running activities right throughout the entire day. Quizzes, cookery demonstrations, even a murder mystery event. That was a whole heap of fun. And this time round, Morella's entertainment offering was just as good as previous Morella cruises. We did like the end of the cruise week shows in the atrium. They were particularly special. And what we really did like was the various performers across the ship coming together and collaborating with each other and putting on a really spectacular performance and a show that entertained all in the atrium. The pool deck screen doubles up as a late night cinema also and that deck area is also used for deck barbecue events and several other fun game shows and activities that Morella put on throughout the week. And on the Morella ship there always seems something to do or to go and see. Now we've slowly warmed P&O's entertainment offerings the more we cruise with them. Iona though did take a big step forward with its modern and contemporary entertainment offering on board. Now the headliner theatre group did put on a range of shows that were clearly aimed at a younger audience and they made good use of the visual effects and various media walls within the very modern theatre too. The clubhouse was a really great music venue and the house band who were called Pulse, well they were really busy throughout the entire week of the cruise. The impressive Skydome area is also used as an entertainment venue although it does have terrible acoustics. Despite the terrible acoustics, it did of course make a brilliant venue for a silent disco. And we have to say that the shows that were put on in the Skydome by the Creator Viva show team, well, they were really different and quite engaging with a very modern and contemporary feel. Iona has so many venues to choose from around the ship, including the 710 Club, which is endorsed by Gary Barlow of all people. There's also the Limelight Club, which is an extra cost, but there are shows put on there by pre-named celebrities, and I use that word in the loosest possible sense, of course. Plenty of quizzes, game shows, and all sorts of other activities were going on in Brody's pub. The pub also shows live sport, and of course Morella doesn't have an equivalent offering. That said, Iona's entertainment, unlike Morella's, isn't in your face and the ship sometimes feels a little bit sleepy as if there's nothing going on. But this is deceiving, as the entertainment programs were rich and really busy, although you often had to go looking for it around the ship. One other difference from Morella was there wasn't any access to the performers at all. There wasn't any meet the showcast events or other similar events. But overall, we have to say, that Iona provided the best entertainment that we've so far experienced on a P&O cruise. MSC Harmonia, although bigger than Morella Discovery 2, actually had a small ship feel to it. Effectively, there were only four venues with activities that you could participate in. The Bar del Duomo was the principal venue for activities and live music, and has a stage and a dance floor too. And it was amazing how the entertainment team used this very simple venue to such great effect. Dance classes, football penalties, mini golf, bingo, fashion shows, as well as live music, of course, and quizzes, all catering for the multinational passenger base and delivered in a multilingual format. It was quite a thing. Music featured in the Harmonia Lounge and the Red Rum Bar too. These were soloists and duos that mainly catered for an older demographic. 
music would also feature in the White Lion Pub, which also showed live sport and football. However, in the White Lion Pub, the musical acts often clashed with live sport events, and you had to feel sorry for the performers, who were often distracted by cheers when a goal went in. And to be honest, this spoiled the enjoyment of both. On the pool deck was a stage, but no entertainment was conducted from this stage for the entire week we were on board. We were a bit baffled by that. One highlight of MSC was the Broadway style shows that featured four times during the week. The show cast were simply excellent and made brilliant use of the limited facilities provided to them. The performers were exceptional and the aerial work and the acrobatics, well they were standout performances for us. Access to the performers though, like Piano, wasn't facilitated. However, these shows were really, really good. When the show cast weren't performing in the theatre, there were singing acts and comedy acts, but these weren't to the same standard as the Broadway shows, unfortunately. MSC's entertainment was a real mixed bag in our view, but we think it was the individual performances that made it good rather than any organisation by MSC. So scoring this is actually quite difficult. We're going to give Morella, I think, five points. We're going to give MSC three and a half points. And we're going to give PO four and a half points. And in this next category, we're going to talk about customer service. And contact with customer service is only typically needed when problems arise. Few problems were experienced on Morella. But requests for cabin maintenance and minor plumbing issues were dealt with swiftly and politely by the customer services teams. No faults or complaints, and the staff were accessible and courteous and polite. P and O teams were always accessible, and despite over 5,000 passengers being on board, the queue never appeared long. We encountered very few issues or problems, and minor issues with our cabin, well, they were actually reported and dealt with by our brilliant cabin steward, Inathio, who really did take it upon himself to ensure your cabin experience was as good as it could be, and we really liked that approach. MSC teams, well, they had had a tough week with other issues that were going on with the crews, but we're going to try and steer clear of those issues, and the teams did deal with maintenance issues swiftly and promptly. Now, exasperation on their part did sometimes reveal itself, but you could forgive that given the week they were having. Now, one thing we really liked was the way a member of staff would triage the queries in the queue and ensure that minor and easy to fix issues could be dealt with quickly, avoiding the need for long queues for many. That really worked well. One minor niggle was that customer services staff, well, they often had to refer queries to a senior manager. And this is perhaps indicative of shortcomings in staff training that we did notice there was an issue across many areas of the ship. So in this category, we're going to score Morella five points. We're going to score MSC three points and we're going to score p &O also five points. So now to the most important category, cost. Now, cost comparisons can be quite contentious. And on our previous comparison videos, many viewers have fed this back. So we'll point out the total cost, including travel to our embarkation point, and also the cost of drinks on the ship. We'll base the comparison on a price per person per night basis, which seems to be the fairest method. We'll exclude speciality dining costs, as the MSC ship didn't feature any speciality dining options, so that wouldn't be fair. So let's start with MSC, and our cruise fare was ridiculously cheap. It was £259 per person for six nights. This seems so cheap, we couldn't pass it up. However, we did need to add on flights to Barcelona and returning from Venice. And even though we booked these with the EasyJet, these one-way flights were a little pricier than expected at £252 per person. Transfers at Barcelona and at Venice worked out at £28 per person, with Venice being the more expensive end. As mentioned, we took the drinks package too, which worked out at £222 per person. So our overall cost with MSC on a price per person per night basis was £126 per person per night. Now let's look at P&O, and our cruise on Iona, the price of that was £699 per person, and it was taking us to the Norwegian fjords, so we sailed from Southampton. The fare we selected was the select fare tariff. There were no flights, of course, but the trains to Southampton cost us £39.50 per person.
We had to take a cab at Southampton, so our Uber cost us £13 per person. But we also had onboard credit of £35 per person due to the fact that we had chosen the select fare option. Our drinks bill for the week was £234.54p. And when you take into account our cruise credit, the overall cost of our cruise on a price per person per night basis was £119.11 per person per night. This was quite a surprise if we're really honest, and it was £20 per person per night dearer than our previous p and cruise at the end of 2023 on a similar itinerary as well. But this time, our cruise experience on Iona was significantly better. Now let's talk about Morella. Our all-inclusive Morella fare was £2,242 per person for a 14-night cruise from Singapore and included all transfers and the standard drinks package, which was more than adequate. Now this equates to £160 per person per night, but you've got to bear in mind that it did include that long-haul flight to Singapore. But amazingly, this price worked out cheaper on a price per person per night basis than our cruise with Morella last year to the Adriatic, which was £178 per person per night. So it seemed that we could travel to Singapore with Morella cheaper than we could travel to the Adriatic. And this does seem to counter some of the statements we often see online that Morella are significantly inflating prices. But that said, it is the most expensive of the three cruises that we took this year, on a price per person per night basis, certainly. Scoring wise, while the price comparison does reveal some interesting insights into value for money, Morella is the most expensive again. And despite the cheap headline cruise fare, MSC did work out more expensive than P&O. But both P&O and MSC were 20% dearer than our best cruise bargain from the previous year. So whilst Morella were a little bit cheaper than last year, P&O, they were definitely dearer this time round, and MSC, well they didn't appear to be the bargain that they made themselves out to be when they were advertising. So what about the scores? Well Morella, well we've given them two and a half points and we've given some credit here for the long haul element. MSC, well we've given them three and a half points. And we've docked, I think, a few points here for cost transparency as the total cost ended up significantly more than the headline price. P&O, well, we've given them four and a half points. And it's not a perfect five due to the significant price inflation in such a short space of time. So now let's look at the overall scores and which of these cruise lines has given us the best overall value for money, taking into account both price and our onboard experience. And our overall scores reveal an interesting picture for sure. Morella scored 33 points, MSC scored 22 points, but P&O scored 44 points. So Morella with 33 points is at least consistent with previous comparisons we've made. And we kind of like that with Morella. You know what you're going to get on a Morella ship and it's fine. And they provide good holiday experiences and we've had plenty of really great holidays on board at Morella and we did this time too on Morella Discovery 2. And given the long haul nature of the flight, we did feel we got reasonably good value for money and we would certainly do it again in a heartbeat. MSC with a low 22 points does reflect a disappointing onboard experience. And now we know people who swear by MSC, but this experience really fell short of the competition. Ultimately, MSC got many of the basics of a cruise experience wrong, and for what we understand from other cruise holiday enthusiasts, MSC does seem to be a bit of a lottery at the moment. And if you have a problematic cruise, well, even if it's a relatively cheap price, well, this really doesn't soften the blow. P&O Iona, on the other hand, really surprised us. It was a brilliant onboard experience, without a doubt, and it was also the cheapest of the three cruises on a price per person per night basis. And this really surprised us. Iona made us feel like we paid to go on a premium cruise line like Celebrity, but on a budget price. P&O got all the essentials of cruising absolutely right. A nice cabin, great food, and a buzzing onboard atmosphere. And there was plenty of space to chill and escape also. Brilliant. And it was also nice to see and o softening their obsession with dress codes just a little, 
making the experiences more accessible to the younger generations who were enjoying all the ship had to offer. Well done P&O Iona and we can see why P&O positioned this as a new to cruise experience. So that's it and this time round it's P&O that claimed the top spot. Well we're done now and we hope you found this video helpful and why not check out our adventures and vlogs on the three cruises that we refer to in this video if you want to see more of what we actually experienced. Thanks for watching. Hello, if you like our channel and you want to see more of us exploring and explore with us, please like and subscribe. It means so much to us.